everybody has their own little model. And that's really the secret is as kids, we idolize because in the generation we are today with the media and so on, we idolize certain players and we want to be those players. What I always tell you is you need to be the best you can be. And you need to understand you, your physiology, your makeup, because that's who you should be focused on. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good afternoon and welcome to another Walker webcast. It is uh, my great pleasure to have Dave Phillips with me today. Let me do a quick intro to Dave, and then we can dive into some very timely topics as it relates to what's been going on in Dave's life, the life of the world of golf, and how many of the things that Dave works on with world-class elite athletes can be applied to all of our both golf swings and golf games, um, our work inside the office, outside the office, and our personal lives. Uh, so Dave Phillips is a visionary thinker with a passion for teaching and learning. He is a PGA professional and is co-founder of TPI, the world's leading educational organization dedicated to the study of how the human body functions in relation to the golf swing. A world-class high-performance coach Dave brings innovation, education, and proven application of sport performance, health, fitness, and wellness to golf, sports, and business around the world. He has worked with numerous players on the worldwide professional golf tour and is a highly sought after speaker and golf media contributor. Dave is ranked as one of the top 100 teachers in the country by Golf Magazine and top 50 by Golf Digest. So Dave, let's start here. Um, you've had quite the past week, given that John Rahm, whom you coach, uh, just won uh, the Masters. Um, let's start with what was last Sunday like for you? Um, you were obviously there, you were behind the scenes. Uh, John wins, uh, what's that feel like? What do you do? Well, you give him a big hug for one. Um, it's great to see someone realize their dreams, you know, and, and to be play, play a small role with that. I, I've known him since he was 17 years old, since he was a young man, and to see him blossom into the person he is. He's an incredible father and husband, and uh, he's just such a, a great person and, and how he not only carries himself, but how he treats his team. And we, we have a great team that we built around John and everybody has a role that they play, no different than a, a great business. And uh, that team communicates extremely well and they allow him to do what he does. And so to, to see him realize his dream of winning the Masters was really incredible. I can't really describe it. I'm still trying to uh, comprehend what this means not only for him, but for the entire team. It's it's a really realization of a lot of our hard work. As the as the weekend progressed, Dave, and um, he's in second place going into the final round, um, trying to track down Brooks Kepka. You're out on the practice tee ahead of that round. Are you what are as as his coach? What are you thinking as it relates to how much is encouragement? How much is don't you're, you're clearly not doing anything as it relates to technique at that point. What do you what, what role are you trying to play at that moment as he's getting ready to go out and play that kind of a round? You know, any, any role that helps him win. So for me, it's about clearing the clutter. Um, unlike some coaches that, that like to be there and be very present. I like to play a little bit of a backward role and I know my place at these events. We do the work before the work. So the week before is when we do our preparation work and get him ready to play. By the time we're in the heat of the battle, he should be ready to go. And, and uh, if I've done my job and the team's done their job, he doesn't really need us. So I, I step back they know where I'm at. They, they, if there is an issue, if there is something that either Adam, his caddy, who's an integral part of the team needs, they know where to find me and I will come out and do what I need to do. But, but really it's more of keeping it very relaxed, keeping it right, a light, maybe sharing a little joke, maybe making him smile, breaking the tension is to me really what, what I did, you know? 
And do you walk the course as he's playing, or do you sit in the clubhouse and watch it on television? No, I, I try and walk the golf course. Now, uh, the Augusta is a little bit difficult because there's a lot of fans following the final group, and to get a good vantage point can be difficult. But I feel like, you know, being there is is really part of the the experience and following your player and watching him in the heat of the battle live is what I love to do. So I, I like to walk. It's also great to exercise for me as opposed to sitting in the clubhouse and watching it on TV. So I, I love to get out there and watch him do his thing. And what makes John such an amazing golfer? I, I know that your real focus is on not so much um, – the actual swing, but making the swing, if you will, appropriate for the body. And and you're and we'll dive in in a moment into what's made your coaching so unique and and the the TPI what it has become. But what is it about John and the work you've done with him that makes him such the golfer that he is? You know, I think John from a very early age when I met him, he asked questions that others didn't ask, and that was more on that that. He, he, you could see he was kind of already thinking at a high level, even in his teens, just by the way he would ask a question. And then, you know, John has what I consider like a photographic memory, his recall of what other players have done, other shots at different times. I mean, going back to Seve Ballesteros and people that were idols to him, he can literally recall every shot Seve hit at a given time. And so th those are just things that are extremely unique. And, and I think that, you know, one of the biggest things with him is he never gives up. And it doesn't matter where he is in a tournament, how far behind he is, he will battle until it ends. And, and that is a trait that I see with all elite level players is they, they never give up. And at, on Sunday as well, uh, a, a very close friend of yours and someone you've worked with quite a bit is Phil Mickelson. And Phil had a spectacular Sunday. So Sunday must have been particularly joyous for you of having both the winner and the runner up um, as both close friends and also uh, people you've worked with. Um, Phil looked better physically than I think any of us who watch him on television have seen him. He seemed relaxed. He, relaxed, he seemed in great shape. Um, what is it that Phil has done to create the longevity in his career that few others have been able to attain? So, you know, that, that goes back quite a long way in that, you know, today it's very much a power game. And um, when you have body mass and good structure, you can actually play this game for a long time. Now, a lot of the younger players that are maybe lighter, maybe smaller frames, they have to use the ground and use their body a lot to produce the same amount of speed as somebody that has mass like a John Rom or a Phil. So, you know, that has been part of his longevity. His swing was always based around length of swing to create speed. And he didn't ever try and rotate very much Phil. So it was a little bit more of the long length of the swing. You have time to generate speed, a short swing like John, you have to use the ground efficiently and you have to know how to use your body. So this is why we look at kinematics and so on and so forth. But specifically with Phil, you know, Phil has yo-yo dieted throughout his life. And, you know, he's he's been open to that. You know, when you're Phil Mickelson, you get invited to dinner. Everybody wants to buy the best meal and get the best bottle of wine. And it's very hard to say no because you want to be part of the equation. So it's easy to overindulge, so to speak. And uh, what we've just tried to do, do as of late is really try and make him make the right choices and the right decisions. And some of that blends into what we built together, which was the company for wellness. And, you know, my background in sports performance, I started looking at lots of different things that athletes were taking that the average person could take. And then I was looking at different, different supplements and how we could use them and why we would use them. And that's been the creation of this business. And so we really put him on a diet that was more of an intermittent fasting diet. And Phil tends to take it to the extreme. So he probably lost a little bit more weight quicker than I wanted him to, or the team wanted him to. And you have to be careful with that. So when somebody loses weight dramatically, you can lose some muscle mass. And when you lose muscle mass, that's not good as we get older. We want to maintain our muscle mass. So right now we're actually in a phase where I'd like him to, to start strength training a little bit more and heavier weight to try and build back that muscle mass that he's lost, but he's in a great place. And I think he's finally figured out what works for him. And it's just exciting. I mean, he's been saying it for a while that he thinks that 
he's about to turn the corner and really play some great golf. And, and I truly believe it. He's swinging as good as I've ever seen him swing. And now, as long as he starts believing, he's still got an enormous amount that he can bring to the game. You know, even at 52 years old, his short game and the way he reads lies and the shapes of the shots he can hit, some of the younger guys can't do that. So it's, it's pretty exciting for Phil. So there are a number of things there, Dave, that you just spoke about that are so interesting to how you've built the business that you've built and become the coach that you have become. Um, let's, if you will, wind the clock back for a moment to working for David Ledbetter and doing video for David Ledbetter um, and and what being the videographer there at the Ledbetter Academy, sort of that from my understanding of what you were doing at that time and slowing down video and looking at people's strokes is really what gave you insight into kind of where the world of golf and the world of coaching was going. Let's talk about that chapter. And then I want to go from there into the physiology side of it and late Nona and going over sure. and seeing Jim Courier's tennis coach. So let's go on the video side first. When you were working with Ledbetter and your job was, I believe, if you will, just being the videographer. So it wasn't given your incredible golf skill that you were there as a, as a golf instructor. It was more of doing the video. And as you were doing the video, you saw something there that was a unique angle on coaching. Talk about that for a moment. Well, yeah. So, you know, back in the early nineties, I wrote with a, at the time I was an assistant golf professional at a country club and a member there had a computer background. And, and with him, we developed a, a piece of software that you could split the screen and you could plug in your video camera, the old VHS cameras, and you could put up two videos of a, a play of side by side and you could draw lines. And now you can do it on your iPhone. Back then we were lugging around these big computers. And uh, we were at a golf show, the, the merchandise show that the PJ has every year in Orlando. And David Ledbetter, who I've known because growing up in Africa, David grew up in Africa as well. A lot of the players that he coached at the time, I was aware of. I even played against one or two of them in, in junior events. And, and basically, um, he saw this program and he, he said, hey, how would you like to work for me? Well, as a young golf professional at the time, not only trying to play competitively, but also teaching to supplement my income. I thought this was the greatest opportunity ever. At the time, he had Nick Faldo, Nick Price, Dennis Watson, David Frost, uh, Ernie Els. These were some of the best players in the world. They were the best players in the world. So to get this opportunity to come to his academy in Lake Nona as his video guy, I didn't really care. I was like, I'll take it, you know. And basically, I went down there and I would follow David around. I would film those players loaded on the computer, sit in the back of the academy and bring up the screens. And then I, it would be David, Nick, myself or or Ernie, Nick, my, you know, it would be I was always there with him. And I was able to get a very quick interaction with dealing with the elite and how you dealt with them. So not only watching and running the computer and running these swings, I learned a tremendous amount from a great coach uh, very quickly. And, and I could see a different path for me. Like there was instruction and there was a lot of people working on instruction there. And David was doing some other things too. And, and as you mentioned, Jim Courier at Lake Nona at the time, they had a fitness center um, run by um, Pat Etcherbury, um, a, gentleman, a gentleman named uh, Jim Lur. And they had built this performance center. They actually still, I believe, have a human performance center down there where they were looking at some different things. So I would go over there and listen to them and, and watch. And we started to integrate a program into David's Academy where people could come down and go through this kind of holistic experience where they would learn about their body, their, their mind, and their golf game. And that's kind of the track I took. And then after three or four years, I did you know, start coaching for him and uh, learn a tremendous amount. And, but I, I noticed a pattern with, with people that came for, for lessons. And that was that a lot of the people would get better immediately and, and go on to do great things. But there were a lot that didn't and they struggled with the information. And I don't think it was, wasn't David. It, the information was incredible. It was more of, there was some underlying thing that I really couldn't figure out. And that's what kind of set me on my journey to try and discover that. And uh, that's that's where which we can tell that story. Yeah, yeah. And I want to I want to I want to get to that story. So 
Um, just one quick thing, which is that as um, uh, you and I share Jay Haas as our friend, it's the way the two of us met each other. When I was talking to Jay last night, I actually mentioned the chapter of being in Lake Nona and going down and watching Courier. And, and you may not know this, but Courier is a dear friend of both Jay's and mine. And so it was really fun last night because Jay didn't know that part of your history. And it was fun to, yeah. to bring him in on that. Um, so you've got the, you've got the video side and kind of, if you will, the technical side, Dave, and now you've incorporated in the physiology of it. You ended up going up to Caves Valley and setting up what I believe is one of the very first performance centers at a, at a club. I talk about, I mean, I'm assuming that when Caves said to you, come be our golf professional, they were expecting you to kind of show up as any typical golf professional would and, and give lessons and, and set up a good group that would provide the membership with lessons. What got the, what got the performance center set up at Caves Valley? Well, you know, one of the things Dennis Sadisha, who was the director of golf there for many years, has been incredible to me and as a great mentor of mine. Um, when I when he asked me if I would consider coming back, I said I, I would, but I want to build something that nobody's built. And he said, Well, what what do you mean? And I basically told him this concept of building a performance center. And we went to some of the members there who were incredibly generous and they helped us put this thing together with the backing of the time Titleist. So Titleist was uh, um, part of a lot of us golf professionals were on their staff and we told them what we were doing and they were very interested in kind of supporting it. So we built back in, I think it originally opened in 1998, the first really high performance center where we had the video bays and force and pressure. And then we had some other bays and a, a small putting studio. And then what was a lounge became a gym and we built a really beautiful area and I had my own driving range and we had cottages at Caves Valley, which they still do today. And it's just an incredible club with incredible members that are very supportive. And I started coaching the, the members there and their guests. And uh, then I would have elite level players at the time, Tom Kite and Hal Sutton and some of those players would come and um, I'd have different tour players visit me and it was incredible. It was an incredible start for me as a young golf professional. And I was getting more and more success and more and more recognition. And I was actually nominated as the, the youngest ever top 100 teacher by Golf Magazine at 32 years age. So at the time when I got that, I was actually a little shocked because there was people on that list that, that were my mentors that weren't top 100 teachers. And it actually slapped me in the face and said, you need to be better at what you do. And that kind of led me on this path to solve some issues that were glaring in the golf instruction business. And so we've got the video with the technical side, we've got the physiology with the, um, if you will, what, what you learned down at Lake Nona, you put all that together into an actual performance center. Now talk about the medical side of it and how you came into contact with your partner to create TPI. Yeah, well, you know, it was an interesting story. I, I was sitting, it was raining one day. And I was in my learning center and lessons were canceling. And one gentleman had showed up and we were like, do you want to go outside? Do you want to, it's pouring with rain. And I was actually reading the Washington Post. And there was an article in there about a gentleman by the name, Dr. Greg Rose, who's my partner in crime. And uh, he had opened the first golf performance center at the base of a gym in Gaithersburg, Maryland called Club Golf. And he basically had hitting bays, 3D biomechanics, physical assessment, and he even had treatment areas. And I was like, what is this? And who is this guy? He's a chiropractor. And I, I, I just picked up the phone and I called him and I said, tell me what you do. And he said, I'll tell you what. He goes, what are you doing today? And I go, well, it's raining. I'm not really doing much. He goes, why don't you jump in the car and drive down? And if you've got a, a student, bring him and I'll show you what we do. So I did. The student was there. We jumped in the car. We drove 45 minutes in the rain down to Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I remember meeting Greg at the door and he basically said to me, he goes, listen, why don't I just show you what I do and then we can talk. And he took the student of mine through a movement screen, a basic assessment of how the body moves. And he was writing down on this piece of paper and it took about five minutes and he turned this piece of paper around to me and he said, that's what they're going to do in their golf swing. And if you try and do anything else, they're going to struggle. And it was kind of like one of those bright light moments that go on on your head because I was like, first of all, I was like, okay, how did you do that? Because you've never watched him swing. And second of all, once he told me, 
I was like, this is it. This is what's been missing in the golf instruction space for so long in that we as golf instructors ask you as the lesson taker to do something, but we never physically assess you to see if you can actually move in that way. And in many ways, what I built in the technology space probably hurt more people than it helped because when we started, we would put you up next to Ernie Els or Nick Faldo and go, here's what you do. Here's what they do. Let's go and do that. And in many ways, that's impossible, right? So I built this piece of tech that was revolutionary at the time and still out there today, but was totally wrong because we missed this, this missing link. And so when I would see players get better, that was because they could physically do what we were asking them to do. And when I could see players get worse, it was because they were trying their hardest, but they couldn't actually physically do it. And that's when Greg and I started spending a lot more time together. I convinced the CEO of Titleist to come down and see what we were doing. We were having a lot of success with players and studying a lot of things that people weren't looking at. And uh, Titleist came to us and said, why don't you build the first Olympic training center for golf? And they gave us this opportunity in 2003 to move to Southern California, where we founded the Titleist Performance Institute. And we have a 40 acre facility in Oceanside, California, that's really dedicated to looking at everything and anything that, that, that we need. And it's phenomenal. Dave, what I find, first of all, the whole story is fascinating how the two of you got into partnership and then brought in Titleist. There, there are a number of things about how you built and scaled the TPI that I think are fascinating as a business. Um, one of the things is that it's not the Dave Phillips Academy. And no. understanding that you had a partner in that, there's more to it than calling it the Dave Phillips Academy. Why didn't you call it the Dave Phillips Academy? Well, first of all, it's never about me. You can only be successful if you build the team, right? And if, it, if you are a one-man show, you're going to get, if you're good, you're going to get so busy that it doesn't matter how many assistants you bring on, they're going to want you. They don't want your assistant, right? So anytime you're successful calling it a name, having a brand behind you, which is now TPI or the Titleist Forms Institute, is really where we went. And Greg and I ran into that issue in that within two or three years, we, we couldn't keep up with the demand. I mean, we were booked eight months in advance with people coming in and going through experiences. That's how I originally met Jay. And we really quickly realized that in order to scale a business, it can't be just Greg and I. And we've got to figure out a way to take what we're learning and, and bring it to a bigger thing. So we, we developed the TPI certified brand. And we said, well, why don't we do an online education platform? And let's teach people to do what we do. And so in the golf space, we did something very unique in that we created something for medical professionals, fitness professionals, which had never been done, as well as golf professionals. And that just expanded our market. So we made a, built a certification brand. Um, we now have over 30,000 TPI certified experts in, 20, in 50, no, 64 countries. And we educate in 10 different languages. And that, that, that has become a a huge business. So we're pretty proud of was that. Tit was Titleist a private company when you started the TPI? Because it's now part of a rather large conglomerate that owns also FootJoy and Pinnacle and a bunch of other brands. Um, was it, it was. private when you all started TPI? It was private when we started TPI. And then when they went to become a public company, Greg and I actually spun off from Titleist and uh, we purchased our piece out of them. And part of that reason was we wanted to go into other sports because we wanted to study rotary athletes and Titleist was a golf company and didn't really understand why we wanted to do that. But in, again, in order to grow your brand, you have to look outside the box. So we started a product called On Base University where we did the same thing we did in golf for baseball. And we look at pitching and hitting. And um, we actually have 16 major league teams that send us athletes and we study them and work with them. And then we developed something called Racket Fit in the tennis world, which looks at serving and ground strokes and uses the physical screening process the same way. We also have a soccer project in Mexico where we have 270,000 kids that we put in a PE program to help develop primal movement patterns that they didn't have. And we are expanding into other sports. So again, it's scaling that business. And then about a year ago, Titleist knocked on the door and said, hold on a second, we need to reown you. So they acquired us back, and, uh, which was incredible. It was incredible to come back to them 
and they've been extremely supportive. We're actually rebuilding our facility right now and building a couple other facilities in the future around the country that can service, you know, all sports. So pretty exciting. I, I, be I believe that they, the holding company has actually expanded. They just bought Juice. I think I'm pronouncing that right, but they're, the, right. they're the both golf clothing as well as skiing apparel manufacturer, uh, which is a fantastic company. And I was very interested that they've gone and bought them. And, and I think it, it does go to you all focusing on golf and then expanding out into other sports. And my, my assumption is that they're looking to do the same thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the powers that be, I think, see that the, the brand, why, why not, right? We've learned so much from what we've done in this space. Can we do it in other spaces? And we've proven very quickly in the baseball world that we can. No one was really doing the movement screens and the assessment that we do. And looking at the things we were looking at, and when we took it into baseball, I think it blew them away, and it's it's been it's been very good. Is there anything, Dave, as it relates to the age at which you're working with athletes? Is there any difference between when you need to get in to start working with a young baseball player versus a young golfer versus a young soccer player? As it relates to all the work you do, I I think about all those sports and when people sort of hit their peak, and uh, I I would think that in at least soccer and baseball, it would appear, and I, I may be completely wrong, that you got to get in earlier than you do in golf, but you're probably going to tell me I'm wrong. It's all about the exact same time. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, everybody matures at a different time. So, you know, the difficulty thing for all of these sports is they try and acquire talent at a very young age, and there's no recipe for that. And it really works when they finish their growth spurt. So you can, you can put a kid into one sport, you know, early, we usually don't see those as the most successful. I mean, you see the most successful kids that have played multiple sports because they're, they're way more um, moldable and teachable when they've learned different aspects from different sports. So we kind of like that multidisciplinary athlete. And then when they're in their early teens is when we really see them kind of, kind of pick their sport and maybe 14, 15, commit to that sport. But, you know, I would suggest at young ages, they should play everything. We, we would much rather have an athlete that can play anything than just have somebody that's played one specific sport. That's really interesting. Uh, going back to Courier, Courier was as good a baseball player as he was a tennis player. Uh, yep. And uh, uh, I think about, I've talked to Jim a bunch about our kids and he would always say, you know, make them great athletes and they'll be able to be great athletes. And now my kids are at any level to be able to play professional athletics, but just that well-rounded athlete. Do you find that much in golf? Because I, clearly there's the John Elway who is as good a, a baseball player as he was a football player. And we can go down the list of a lot of the major athletes. Um, but in golf, it would appear to be that as much as elite athletes as they are, that they have to specialize on golf. Is there anyone out there who actually was a tennis player at the same time as becoming a, a, a top junior golfer? Oh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot. I mean, there's, there's golf. Oh, really? Like, oh, that's oh, yeah, really I mean, interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, there's definitely, I mean, you know, there, there are kids that specialize in the sport and become great. But honestly, if you look at the very best, if you go and look at major champions and ask them what they did when they were a kid, they'll all tell you we played everything. And there's many that could have gone and been professional baseball players, professional swimmers. I mean, I think Dustin Johnson could have played anything. He's an incredible athlete, right? And now we're starting to see a much bigger athlete come into the game. I mean, John Rahm is six foot three, 240 pounds. I mean, he's like a linebacker. He's huge, right? And he's a big, big body. And if you look at the PJ Tour today, you know, 25, 30 years ago, they used to say being 5'10 and X, you know, 170 pounds was the ideal golfer. Well, the ideal golfer today, even though there's a lot of those, the, is really more of bigger mass because you put less stress on your body. So 200, 220 pounds, six foot three, four creates effortless speed because of width. So we're seeing a bigger athlete come into the game that, that could have gone to baseball or those other sports. And I think a lot of kids are picking golf because it's pretty cool. You can make a lot of money and it's a lifelong thing. I mean, we've got players making like Phil, 52 years old, making millions of dollars and finishing second at the masters. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah. One of the things is you were talking about those body types. It made me think about Victor Hovland, who looks as cut as any athlete I've ever seen, at least on television last weekend. He kind of, he, you could just tell he's got great upper body strength and probably spends a lot of time in the gym. On the other end of that is John, who's got this huge 
sort of body. How do you work with John as it relates to, I mean, would you, would you rather have the natural size and scale of John and allow him to be a little bit less out in shape than a smaller Victor Hovland who's in the gym all the time? What do you find from the physiology there as it relates to both club head speed as well as just overall performance management. And obviously John won last weekend and Victor did not. So there's, yeah. there's that, but what about that? Because the, as I watched on television, Dave, it just, um, you could just tell how physically fit Victor Hovland is and how many of the other athletes on the, on the PGA tour, the Netflix series is showing all of us how much time they all spend in the gym. Yeah. So I, I think everybody's different. That's why we created a movement screen, right? That movement screen is, is designed to look at what we call the stability mobility model. I look at the foot, I look at the ankle, I look at the knee joint, I look at the hip joint, the lower back, the thoracic spine. It's an alternating pattern of stable segments connected to mobile joints. We do that screen to see if that's functioning first. If it's not, we try and get that moving because that's what you were when you were a baby. So let's bring that back because that's longevity in your sport. If you've had an actual injury or something, that stopped you, then we need to address that immediately. But when you look at the different body types, um, you know, John can create pretty effortless speed with a very short swing because he has mass and he moves exceptionally well. So most people would say that, oh, he has a short swing. He has a tight thoracic spine, tight hip mobility. He doesn't. The reason he has his short mm -hmm. swing is because he had a club foot when he was a kid and they had to break his ankle and that ankle won't flex. So if I lengthen the swing, which I could, I'm going to put more stress up the chain and that could break him. So that's kind of why you have to understand your body swing connection, right? Uh, Victor Hovland is a different body completely. So Victor tends to have long legs, a shorter torso, very long arms. He's a lot leaner as a Roy McElroy is, as a Will Zalatoris is than John. They need to use the ground more effectively to create speed. In terms of longevity, this is a sport you're going to play for a long time. You know, there's a lot of research that shows that having a little bit of body fat is actually good for you because it actually helps you when you're out there burn energy better. So, you know, don't get confused by a golf body. If I showed you somebody that looks a little overweight and out of shape for their golf swing, they may move perfectly. Right. And mm -hmm. unlike some of the other sports, I mean, if you go back to baseball, there's some baseball pitches that were pretty big and out of shape looking, but could throw at 100 miles an hour. There's still some baseball players today that you wouldn't actually say, wow, that guy's ripped, right? But they still smash it over the fence. So everybody has their own little model. And that's really the secret is as kids, we idolize because in the generation we are today with the media and so on, we idolize certain players and we want to be those players. What I always tell you is you need to be the best you can be and you need to understand you, your physiology, your makeup, because that's who you should be focused on. And I'm looking for that kid that tells me, you know, when you ask him, who's your favorite player? I've had kids that are elite that say, I don't really have a favorite player. I'm just trying to be the best I could be. That's the greatest line in the world, right? I think, I think, I think Jordan Spieth said that to you, did he not? He did actually. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And, and many uh, others. I mean, they admire what other players do. I mean, you know, John admires Seve Ballesteros for what he did. He admires Phil. There's certain things, but what he takes from them is certain things, and then he makes them his own. And that's really the secret to the elite. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. When I hear you talk about the physiology of it, Dave, it's, it's so evident of the way that, I mean, when you walk that through anyone as a layman, I hear that and it's so technical, it's so precise and it, and, and it makes so much sense. How much of your time is on the physical side of it versus on the mental side of it? And when you work with your players on the mental side of it, what types of things do you work with them on? Do they meditate? Do you walk through courses and shots with them? How on the on, Golf is such a mental sport. How much time do you spend with someone like John, John talking about the mental side versus the physical side? Yeah, the mental side is huge in, in anything, right? But it, you also have to have a certain level of skill. So like if you're a beginning golfer and I get you in front of a mental coach and he says, you need to visualize good shots, you can't even hit a good shot. So how are you going to visualize a good shot, right? When you talk to somebody like John Rahm, they're at a whole nother level. So they're not thinking about the way their golf swing is or this during the golf swing during a tournament. If they are, that's my fault. I haven't done my job. So really what you're looking at is what is that connection, that 
that mental side of it. How can I get you in your own space and out of your head in many ways? And it's really deflecting all the clutter. And this is kind of the next phase of what John's going to have to go through is there's going to be more cameras in his face. There's going to be more requests from media. There's going to be more and more eyeballs on him. And, uh, you know, he had his, he had just figured out his kind of way. And now he's won a major and there's a bigger expectation. So now it's really sitting down with our mental team. And we have, there's two, two great people on our team that, that John uses, one, Dr. Brett McCabe, and another one, Yoseba, who is uh, from Spain. And, and he's great because he can talk to John in his own language, which right. I think is important because, you know, you could get some things lost in translation. And now it's their role as he grows to, to try and get him kind of where he is. My role is, is to identify that we have a problem and then call in the team member that's most uh, appropriate for that problem. As a coach, do you do mental stuff? Of course we do. We, we always do. We're always trying to get our player to, to achieve what we know they're capable of. And, and that's the art of coaching. You talked about baseball and tennis and soccer. Um, I know you spent some time focusing on F1. Is there anything specifically from F1 that you're pulling that is, if you will, the most applicable to to golf, whether it be phys- physical or mental? Well, you know, I mean, obviously we've seen the, the series on Netflix. I think everybody has, and it's really brought F1 into a different light. And I think they're, they've got 30% more viewers now than they ever had before. But I started looking at it quite a while ago because – I've done some performance driving and used to race motocross when I was a kid. And, and so I, I understand that space. And I just started looking at other sports outside of ours. Is there anything that we're missing? And one of the things I noticed in Virago, Italy, um, Formula One medicine, that, that is the medical arm of Formula One, they have a mental acuity training gym. And I've never really seen that before. And that was eight stations you go through where they're measuring your brain and how you respond to different things. And they're really training the brain. And their whole understanding there was that if you're training your body and you're training your skill, but you're not training your brain an equal amount of time, you will never be able to optimize the other two. And that kind of hit home with me. So I started looking at what they were doing and seeing if I could bring that into our space. You know, and a lot of it is visual acuity, and you would you would expect that from driving performance is that your vision and seeing the gaps at the speed they're driving has to be very good. But a uh, visual side of golf is way bigger than people think. Although it's not like baseball where we're hitting a moving ball, we're hitting a ball that's still. But the amount of information we have to take in to hit that ball is incredible in a very short amount of time. So not only are you judging the lie, you're picking the club, you're looking at the wind, you're looking at the conditions, you're looking at where you are in the field. Is it a go time? Is it a layup time? What is it? You have to process all this information. And the faster I can train your visual acuity to do that, the quicker you can make a decision that's decisive and you can hit your shot. So that's just something that Formula One, I've been studying and learning, and I'm kind of now bringing it into the Performance Institute at TPI. It's really fascinating. The, the breadth of what you focus on, Dave, and the, the constant desire to bring new ideas and new concepts into your world writ large, not just golf. Uh, golf is obviously the primary focus, but beyond that, pulling in and expanding TPI and other sports and things of that nature. Um, you had you grew up and you've lived in 24 or 27 different countries. You were British by by origin, but moved to South Africa. What is it in the way you were brought up that has either created that incredible curiosity that you have for all things in the world or the grit and determination that there was never anything that was that stable around you? And because you moved so much and learned how to play golf in Papua New Guinea, that you, you know, have this desire to either continue to learn or a sense of um, uh, constantly trying to find the new thing just because that's the way that you were brought up? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I, I was born in England, raised in actually in East Africa, in Kenya. And, um, you know, through my my father's job, who was in the military and then worked in the United Nations and some other crazy stuff. But um, basically, 
had me traveling at a very young age. I had an older brother and sister that were sent to boarding school in Australia. And because I was the youngster, he kind of wanted me with him and my mother. And I learned to adapt. I was like a chameleon, right? You're changing schools. I went to 13 different high schools. I went to lots of different, you know, and, and you need to blend in very quickly in these countries. So I think as a young person, I got very adapt to understanding my surroundings, understanding what was good and bad about them, and really understanding how to interact with people. And, and that gave me this very broad expansive vision. So my upbringing gave me this ability to look beyond what's right in front of me, yet have that ability to focus because of how dangerous some of the situations we were in, in, in Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, and so on and so forth at the time. And as a young child, you can get yourself in some trouble in Africa too. You know, there's wild animals running around and some, some crazy stuff. So it, it did shape me as a person and a coach in that it enabled me to see beyond what maybe some other people aren't looking at. And that's what I've always continued to do. I felt like, you know, to really be the best I can be and to be an asset to the players that I coach, I, I need to have this broad vision. I need to be looking at things that others aren't. And that's partly why we went into other sports because I was like, well, what are they doing baseball? And what are they doing in these sports? And by learning from those different athletes, can I bring what I learned from there into this? And I've just continued to do that. And, and now I'm doing that kind of in the functional food space and looking at, you know, products out there that elite level athletes are taking for longevity and lifespan, which is very interesting to me because I, I've seen my parents at an older age and my father specifically deteriorate um, through a stroke and, and it's not fun. And, and now I'm kind of in that mode where I'm like, I, I need to figure out how to, how to do better at, at finding the things that are right in front of us in many cases. And so that's kind of my next journey and my, my journey now. Have you uh, have you either followed or read Peter Atia's new book as it relates to longevity? It's uh, I have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Peter's Peter's quite something. I, I haven't read his new book, but I'm very much looking forward to diving into it because I've watched Peter's podcast and and all of his medical side of what he does, but then also the life the life, if you will, lifestyle piece of what Peter focuses on is really quite fascinating. Yeah, it, it really is, and and there you know Peter is just one of many. Doctor Andy Galpin that's been on his uh, yeah is yep. part of our team as well. And, and, you know, he looks at the blood in a different way. And there's so many things out there that we can be doing. And, you know, we have a healthcare crisis in this country and we need to build a well care system, not a healthcare system. People should take accountability for their own health. And there's so many things that you can do every day. And we're clogging the system up with things that doctors really don't need to be doing. That's why, you know, there's an app like K-Health that a friend of mine developed, which uses AI to help you understand what's wrong with you. And it's brilliant. Like you, it's actually more accurate than most, you know, go, mo most doctors can be. In fact, and for most doctors, it's their first point now. So things like that and the use of AI and how the world is going to change dramatically from AI is extremely interesting to me, and especially somebody that's been in this physical screening and movement space. And, and back into that as well. To me, movement should be a vital sign. Right? You don't know if you've got a heart condition unless somebody plugs a monitor on you or you go to the doctor, but you know if you can't get out of that chair or your knee hurts, right? So to me, improving somebody's mobility stability can affect so much in the future because most people that go down, you know, they go down from a fall and then their life changes dramatically because they can't move anymore and they can't do the things they used to love to do. So movement is paramount to me. You've got to be able to move. Do you, um, you mentioned blood work. I'm assuming that most of your elite athletes do blood work on a consistent basis. And then I'm also assuming that they wear either aura rings or whoops. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah. 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 I mean, most of them are, are, we're doing some form of panel just to check what's going on. And uh, some are more, you know, into it than others, but uh, yeah, you know, just, just understanding really what's going on is, is important. Yeah. Um, as people listen to you as a very successful coach and businessman, there's a side to you that they may, they, I'm, I'm assuming many assume is there, but you're also an incredible golfer yourself. Talk about uh, a day at, on the old course at St. Andrews that, um, turned out to be a very interesting one for you. Yeah, that, that, that takes me back. I mean, you know, I, I grew up playing as a junior golfer and idolizing the Open Championship like many do, and especially being born in England. That was what my dad always was like, this is the greatest course in the world. And uh, 
1995, I, I got to play the old course at St. Andrews and uh, had a, a Scottish caddy that basically told me where to hit it. And uh, he'd be like, hit it over that bush and hit it over that. And, and I ended up shooting, tying the course record at the time. I shot 63 at, at the old course at St. Andrews. It was a spectacular day. And it's, uh, it, you know, one of those things in your life that you know, it's the lowest score I've actually ever shot is 63. And to do it there and to actually tie the, it, the course record at the time, it's actually 61 today. And the course is a little longer. So it's kind of long gone. But during that time, that was a pretty cool thing. And uh, I always remember it because I, I got to go back there last year for the British Open. And I still see some of the bunkers that I hit it over. And I'm still amazed where I actually hit it back then, because if if I'd have known what was out there, there's no way I would have chosen the lines this caddy told me to hit it on. And uh, you just wouldn't do it. So I just totally took yeah. the steering wheel and gave it to him. And I said, I'm playing pretty good. Just tell me where to hit it. And he kept telling me where to hit it. And it was amazing. It was amazing beyond every course that has a view of the ocean because i've heard you talk about just being incredibly happy and blessed to be on a golf course anywhere with a view of the ocean what's your favorite course uh that's that's a hard one i mean there's so many incredible golf courses in this world and that's what makes golf such a, a an amazing sport right i was actually at a dinner last night talking to some friends from germany and some some other friends and and it didn't matter what level of golf we were at we all shared this common experience and if you think about golf for business it's incredible um for me you know uh, i've gotten to play augusta national i don't think there's a better conditioned golf course where you can relate to what you've seen on tv and you can't until you play it and you see the hills but in the small amount of space that they have and the amount of land they have there is not a lot it is an incredible layout of a golf course um i always like where jay's a member marion is one of my favorite golf courses in the world i i just think the old designs um just just lend themselves so beautifully to the lay of the land and thinking back to the when these courses were built where they were using you know horses to move plows to move dirt and they didn't really do much they took the topography and the terrain the way they did is amazing uh royal melbourne in australia is one of the most spectacular pieces of property in the world and then there's some courses in new zealand and, you know, one of the courses I played my first ever round of golf at my first ever 18 holes at is Lay Golf Club in Papua New Guinea. And it, I, again, I still remember every hole of that golf course and the first round, first 18 holes I ever played, my dad signed me up for the junior championship. And I never played 18 holes before and put me in the junior shop and I shot 118 in the junior championship in my first ever 18 rounds of golf. So that has a little place in my heart because that's where I started. So Dave, you have a incredibly scaled business um, and you are also the coach, the number one golfer in the world. What's the next challenge? What's the next frontier? It, uh, it feels like you um, have built so much and to a great degree have been able to do exactly what you want to do, but do it in a way where you're not, um, you're not having, I mean, if you had gone and just been Dave Phillips, the coach, as you identified previously, that is not a very scaled business model. You're, you're beholden to your brand. You're beholden to that one player that you are coaching. And what you've been successful at doing is building a very scaled business that allows you to go and do other things. And then also to coach the very best in the world and beyond going into new sports and doing baseball and whatever else, what's the, what's the next chapter have for Dave Phillips? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think I think we're just getting started, you know, it, it's really amazing. It's like, I don't feel like this is work. I, I mean, I love what I do. I mean, I, I grew up playing golf. I mean, I get paid to do what I do is amazing. And, you know, you don't get to where you want without putting it out there. I'm a big believer. If you can't see it, you can't be it. So everybody should have that vision of where they want to go. And you're going to battle to get there. But as long as you keep looking at it, you'll get there. And you just keep moving. And that's that's what I did. That's how I got out of Africa and got to America. My dad didn't want me to go. And I was like, I'm going to college in America. And I came here with $37 in a suitcase. And, you know, you do the things you got to do, but you've got to put it out there. And John Rahm, he's only just getting started. So when I look at him and everybody's like, he's number one player in the world. He's got you know, all this stuff. I'm like, 
it, it's like the start. It, this guy could be dominant. He he is. There's no doubt that he is getting better and better. But we're still we still got a long way to go with him. So I'm more excited for everybody to see what he can potentially do. And I, and I, as I said it before, we have an incredible team. I play a role on that team. The rest of the team, from our fitness professionals to our medical to everybody. To Adam, his caddy, who is absolutely amazing. I mean, he is the glue that holds us together during competition. He's the first person I talk to after a round because I want to get his perspective before I talk to John. Because it's easy to see him in a bad shot on TV and go, what did you do on 18? And then you talk to Adam and he goes, well, the wind was coming out of the left. And, you know, he was aiming a little right because he was worried about this. And that's why. And you're like, oh, so he actually had a pretty good shot. It just went over there. So, you know, you always got to understand where you're at. But I think the next phase for me, this this longevity wellness side, I think everybody's talking about longevity. It's a big buzzword today. I think, as Peter Atia said, I think lifespan is more important. And that is, we want to live a healthy life for as long as we can, right? We don't want to get into that phase of life where we can't move and we can't do anything. That's no fun for anybody. And I'm seeing that with my own father today. And, and you know, that is something that I think we need to change. And there's things out there we can do learning from sports, learning from other great physicians like the Peter Atias, like the Dr. Andy Galpin, um, like the Huberman podcast and what they're doing is just exceptional. And learning those things and going down that road of, of doing something a little different in this, this company that I, I built, you know, for wellness with Phil. And the name itself lends to what we're doing. It's an incredible name. And we're looking at things that you can put in your body that help you help you lead lead a better life and, and not just food, but but there's going to be other things as well. And I, I just I can't wait to to go on this journey with Jay and some of the other people that are involved. Well, Dave, um, it's super evident from talking to you for this hour why you're as successful as you are. Um, the humility with which you carry yourself and all of your success is uh, is noteworthy. And I'm just super thankful that you took this time to talk about everything going on in your world right now. Uh, safe travels to Australia. Have a great trip. And I greatly you. appreciate you spending the time on the Walker webcast. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great week.